Hi everyone, I'm Georgia Weedman and I'll be your keynote editor today. First off, I need to thank HackerOne. Ever since I wrote my book, Penetration Testing, a hands-on introduction to hacking, I've wanted to make it easier for people to launch their careers in information security. So when HackerOne approached me about this keynote and suggested that I talk about my own career journey, I was very excited to say yes. This is something I've wanted to talk about for a while. Hopefully you guys can take my career journey and apply it to your own career, at least in some ways. Obviously there'll be some differences, but hopefully it'll resonate in some ways at least. Without further ado, I suppose we should get started. So. I guess there's really like two stories, right? There's hero's journey and there's the romance. I'm not really ready to call myself a hero per se, maybe anti-heroine. And as for the romance, you know, it's boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy learns some stuff and evolves and hopefully gets the girl back. Well, I am a girl, so we'd have to switch that. And you know, as we'll talk about in just a minute, I've never been really great with people. So instead of it being, you know, about boy and girl, let's make it about a girl and a horse. And speaking of horses, this is one of my horses from when I was a kid. This is Tristan. And I learned from Tristan that even though I couldn't understand people all that well, I could understand horses and I could relate to them. And on top of that, I learned that I love winning. You may be able to see some of my ribbons behind me. I still love winning, competition, all that is a lot of fun for me. And I learned that, you know, while I may not be, you know, the tallest or the thinnest or the smartest or, you know, any of those things, with hard work and dedication and just not giving up, I can succeed at what I try to do. So I learned that from the horse competitions as a kid and that has helped me forward through my entire career. That has been, I think, if there was one thing, it was, you know, don't give up, work hard, carry on, and, you know, that will be nine-tenths of the way to success most of the time. So I encourage you all to do the same, as hard as it may be sometimes. So I'm from rural Mississippi. I've pointed it out on the map for you, if those of you who are not familiar with it. But, you know, despite Mississippi, I actually had a lot of things going for me. I'm from a town called Madison. It's, it's pretty small. Around the time I was born, there was like 7,500 people, and it's really boomed since then, and it's doubled in size. There's about 15,000 people there now. But it was relatively well-to-do, well, for Mississippi. The schools were pretty good. Again, for Mississippi. I can read. I'm allowed to say that because I'm from Mississippi. Anyway, and the biggest thing for me was my mother actually had a PhD in computer science. She got it when I was like three. So that's some of my first memories is her doing, you know, the computer stuff for her dissertation and that was a big deal for me because I never really got as a kid like you can't do this because you're a girl you can't be in computers or girls don't computer that I don't remember ever hearing that and if I had heard it it would have just like gone right over my head because in addition to having that role model from my mother you know her other friends were you know women in STEM as well so I would have known that that was nonsense and I know that you know a lot of young women and other minorities don't get that they don't get that role model that that looks like them in their you know career field so I was really lucky in that way for sure but I did realize that, you know, I wasn't necessarily like other girls or even like boys for that matter, but I didn't really know why. I actually didn't know why until I was an adult. Even after, you know, psychiatrists had mentioned autism as a possibility for me, it just didn't really resonate because a lot of the literature even today is based entirely on studies of, of boys and men, so there wasn't really a lot that necessarily spoke to me. For instance, you know, special interest is a big thing with autism and, you know, I was obsessed with horses as a kid, but I guess that's kind of normal for a girl. All girls are supposed to be obsessed with horses, but, you know, it was really the same thing as a obsessive special interest for, for a boy. Just no one noticed because it was horses and I was a girl and that was cool. Anyway, so I read this book as a young adult called Asper Girls by Rudy Simone. If you happen to be a female on the spectrum or think you might be or, you know, might love someone who is, I would definitely recommend this book because it was really an aha moment for me. I was like, okay, that's me. And then I gave it to everybody I know and they're like, yeah, that's you. Totally. So that made a lot of sense for me and kind of put a lot of the pieces together about like why I kept screwing up with people as hard as I tried. But... 
there is kind of the trope of if you've met a person with autism, that's exactly what you've done. You've met a person with autism because we are very different. And the way I have my autism expressed and understood is possibly very different from how if you're on the spectrum as well, it might be very different from yours. Or again, if you have loved ones or anything like that on the spectrum, you know, it's, it's possibly very different. But for me, it really comes around to I don't understand people at all. You know, your gestures and your intonations and all that stuff you do. I have spent my entire life trying to mimic and understand it, but I'm still, I get it so wrong sometimes. And things like knowing when to talk. You know, if I talk for too long, people get annoyed. Or, you know, if there's a pause and I'm supposed to talk then, I don't catch it and they get annoyed. So I kind of go to, well, I just won't talk at all. I'll just ignore people and be by myself. And then people think I'm a jerk and they're annoyed with me and that bothers them too. So, you know, it really has not gone very well a lot of the time, but understanding that, you know, I do have, you know, a condition and it's not just me, you know, being lazy or being a jerk has gone a long way for, you know, my understanding of myself at the very least. Additionally, you know, I really like structure and concreteness. Things like jokes and abstraction are, are often somewhat lost on me. But I think the biggest thing for me is that I have had to develop a lot of coping skills. I had somebody say on the internet once, because, you know, people say stuff about you on the internet and it sticks with you. I had someone say that I didn't have a lot of coping skills. So a mentor of mine made me this, this great picture and... This is, I guess, a coping saw and there's some skills in it. So now I have many coping skills, but I have had to develop these coping skills you know, as I've gone through my life and continue to develop them today. But I'm certainly, I think, doing a lot better than when I started at the very least. But I think the big one for me is eye contact. Eye contact for me and a lot of other autistic people that I've talked to, it hurts. If you've ever read or seen the movie of Dune, when, you know, early on Paul has to put his hand, like, in the box, and if he takes it out, he's gonna get killed, but he thinks, like, when they let it out, it's gonna be all burnt off in a stump because it hurts that bad, and the fact that he can stand it, it's, like, proof that he's gonna save the universe. That's what looking in people's eyes does for me. It really hurts. So, one of the coping skills I developed, because if you just, like, don't look at people's eyes, they... You know, think you're not interested, think you're a creep, you know, all sorts of different things. Bad things happen to you if you don't. If you're, for instance, trying to sell a product to a customer or raise venture capital and you're not looking at the person, that generally doesn't go very well. So a coping skill I have developed is looking at people's foreheads and I find that no one can tell that I'm doing it and it's a lot more comfortable for me and it works out pretty well. And another one... If any of you happen to be nearsighted, this works really well for me in things like stages. And well, I'm not on a stage now, but I would be if I was actually there. But, you know, if you guys were actually in the audience for me, one thing that I do is I don't wear my glasses on stage. So I actually can't see anything but just blobs. So people could be sleeping or making faces or, you know, doing whatever. And I would just see nothing but a blob. So as long as the person isn't like right here, even in a conference room setting, you know, I'm able to, you know, look like I'm looking at them intently when I can't really see their face. So, you know, if you happen to be nearsighted and autistic, something maybe to consider. And now none of you will ever be able to tell whether I can really see you or not. So, who knows? So, let's talk a little bit about my early life. I was, I guess the word for it now is bullied. I was bullied a lot. I didn't know I had autism. I knew there was something different about me. I think a lot of people thought, you know, I was just a jerk or not trying or just straight up weird. You know how kids can be about those sorts of things. So, you know, I, I did not succeed socially in my early life, shall we say. So... My decision was that I was going to go to college after the 8th grade, so I did. I went to the program for the Exceptionally Gifted at Mary Baldwin College when I was 14, and I graduated when I was 18. This is a picture of me in college. I definitely stole that costume from the like theater department trailer that was behind my dorm one year, and I love it. I wish I still had it, but I'm sure I gave it back like a good person. 
Anyway, so I got a math degree. I didn't want to do computer science because I didn't want to be like my mother because I was, who wants to be like their parents when they're like 16? Most teenagers don't. So I was going to do math and then I was applying around to math grad schools and I quickly realized that I was not going to be Einstein and I probably didn't want to spend my life teaching pre-calculus to, you know, people who probably didn't even want to be there at community college, so I decided maybe I needed another career path. But as a fun fact, University of Virginia rejected me as a graduate student, but last year they actually invited me back to be a guest lecturer for the computer science department, so, you know, I got the last laugh in that that part because, you know, I wasn't good enough to be a student, but now I'm cool enough to be a guest lecturer. I didn't actually apply at Oxford, but I'm sure they would have rejected me as well, but... Earlier this year, I actually went and I was a guest lecturer for the cybersecurity PhD program at the University of Oxford. So, you know, all my academic failings aside, I think that has worked out pretty well for me in the end. So, again, I got the last laugh on that. So, I, I did end up doing computer science. I did end up becoming my mother, just like I hoped I wouldn't. But, you know, as I've matured more, I've seen that, you know, following in the career footsteps of my mother in the computer sciences was not a bad idea after all. So I went to graduate school and in computer science and there was this thing called the Cyber Defense Club. And I didn't know anything about cyber defense. All I knew about hacking was that that was how you go to jail and I didn't figure with my social skills I would fare very well in prison. So I figured that was probably not the career path for me. But the captain of the Cyber Defense Club, well, let's just say he was um, interesting. So I decided to join the Cyber Defense Club, and we did this thing called the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. They have them all over. If you're a college student, I would definitely encourage you to look them up. It is possibly the worst three days of your life as a student. You are a blue team member. You know, the network's under attack by real attackers, actually, you know, pen testers by day volunteering to do this. You've got a CEO that hates you. They want you to put up new services. Everything is just awful. It's probably the worst, like I said, the worst blue team situation you'll ever find yourself in. But it's also a lot of fun. And from that competition, I realized this is what I want to do with my life. Not be a blue team member by any means. But I wanted to be the red team. I wanted to be those, those pin testers that were on the other side. And, well, as for the boys, since you know we were talking romance about this... That didn't work out so well. I definitely didn't get the boy. He's married to the girl he was dating then, so I don't think he ever gave me a backward glance, honestly. But that's okay. I may not have gotten the guy, but I found my career path, so it was definitely a net positive. So thanks to him, I found, you know, my future. So that worked out pretty well. So I graduated from, from grad school, and I had tons of job offers just because I had a computer science master's, like all of the... The government contractors, they didn't care whether I knew anything about security, just the fact that I had a master's degree in security. So I get all these emails all the time, like, how do I get into security? And I always feel bad, because I feel like I kind of cheated, because I didn't really, when I, you know, I knew a bit from the Cyber Defense Club, but comparatively to, I guess, probably what I needed to know, I didn't really know anything. I just had a piece of paper. So, again, I feel like I kind of cheated, but that was my way into security. I got a degree, and then they just came and hired me. But I wasn't really happy with the kind of job that I had. I was doing blue team for the government, but it really amounted to I was helping people update their iTunes and being told no, like, when I found a vulnerability, like, you know, basic stuff that you find with the scanner, like, missing patches. Oh, we can't patch that because it would break this, and I had no authority to tell them they had to, so, you know, it was really kind of a lost cause sort of thing. And I wanted more. I really wanted to make the world a better place, save the world with security and things like that. And... I obviously was not getting that in my current job, so I was looking to other cybersecurity people and, you know, I saw that they were giving talks at conferences all the time, doing research, giving talks, and they had jobs where you could work from home, which sounded great to me because, you know, people, autism, this was around the time I found out I actually had autism and had a, a reason for all this, you know, angst about people, but certainly working from home would be fun. 
and also getting to do actual pen testing work and you know make the world a, a more secure place so i decided okay i'll do some security research i did a little project on text message botnets you know before they were popular nowadays that's you know the cool way to spam but you know i thought it was fairly interesting so i did that and i submitted it to a small local conference called ShmooCon. Little did I know that it was one of the, you know, most prestigious cybersecurity conferences in the world. And I'll never know why, but the review team decided to let me in with my five months of experience in computer security at that point. And, yeah. Though I got the, like, time slot right. It was noon on Sunday. Which, if you've ever been to one of these conferences, Saturday night is a really big party night. So noon on Sunday is maybe not the best time ever. So I figured it wouldn't be particularly well attended. But what I did was I had a little red wagon and I filled it with beer. And I walked around saying there was going to be free beer at my talk. I even had this little free beer sign. And I filled that room, guys. So, I guess, use whatever tools you have, be it free beer or otherwise, to get what you want, because some people saw my talk, and some of them recommended me to other conferences, and that started my speaking career. So, I guess the lesson learned from that is, you know, in hindsight, it was very naive of me, and perhaps a little arrogant to be like, oh, I've never given a talk ever, I'm just going to submit it to, like, one of the really hard to get into conferences that's, like, really prestigious, but... I don't think you should ever say no for other people. It's really easy to. It's really easy to be like, oh, they're going to laugh when they see this. There's no way they'd take me. But people are going to tell you no plenty in your career. Never say no for them. So be naive. Be arrogant. Put yourself out there for things that you don't actually, if you stop and think about it, feel like you're even qualified to do. Because it might work out really well for you. Like it did for me, because I went from here to, I was giving talks all over the world, I started doing training, I got that job that I wanted, working from home and doing pin testing, you know, things were definitely looking up for me. And then there was this thing called the DARPA Cyber Fast Track, I really wish they still had this. DARPA Cyber Fast Track was basically, if you guys have ever done any like, government grant stuff, you basically have to have somebody whose job is to do the paperwork because it's really involved and you just have to know all the right stuff to do it. It takes a long time for it to go through and a lot of paperwork. Cyber Fast Track was not like that. I think I turned it in on a Wednesday and I got it the next Monday and it was like a seven page application as opposed to probably 700 for your normal government grant. So it was aimed at you know hackers giving them government financing to do their research and again this was naivety and a little bit of vanity being like oh cyber fast track i've got what 18 months of experience now i can totally do that so i submitted i got it funny story i lost my job over it because they didn't want me to do it and have the job so i mean how hard can it be let's just start my own company so I started my own company, started doing like pen testing gigs and other consulting, doing my training through there, and I had government money, so it was cool. Well, I kind of had government money because I actually had to invoice them in order to get the money, and I didn't know what an invoice was. So actually today I still use the invoice template for both my companies that the DARPA Cyber Fast Track sent me when I was like, I don't know what that is to get my money. So again, you know, don't say no for anybody else. Submit to things that you don't think they'll even consider you for. That's how I did my smartphone pen test framework. I got to speak at all the, you know, black hats and DEF cons and things like that. I got into backtrack, you know, before Cali there was backtrack. So I had a tool in backtrack. Everything was coming up roses for me. Around the same time, I got approached to write a book. Everybody thought I was going to do a mobile book. And again, I'm like, got two years experience maybe now. Totally qualified to write a, a book about my subject. But I didn't write mobile. I really wanted to write this book that is specifically aimed at beginners. I really wanted to write the book that I wished I'd had. So I didn't have a lot of mentors when I was coming in. Maybe it was a social skills thing mainly, but... You know, when I had questions, I there was nobody I could really ask about it. So I really wanted to write this book because it was a book I wished I'd had. And so other people could have it, you know, as they were trying to come up. And, you know, from the 
results that I've gotten, at least, you know, from the people that I've heard from, it has helped a lot of people get in, and that makes me really happy. And I'm supposed to talk about, like, things about the next book. The next book is coming. I know I get a thousand emails a day about, like, when is it coming out? It is coming out. Um, I have a really good Easter egg for you guys. Check out my Twitter. It's just my name. I'll put it out, you know, the day this talk comes out. And, you know, I guess as a little teaser for it, you know, the lab for the first book has not aged very well. And I really wanted to fix that problem for the second book. And I have fixed it in a wonderful way with a great partnership with, you know, someone who is, you know, in the business of doing online labs. And it's going to be awesome. So definitely check that out. And let's carry on for now. But check that out. So everything's going great, right? So everything has to go horribly wrong, right? Sometimes life just bucks you off, in my case, since I'm a horseback rider. And I got bucked off big time. So, it all started really with Poland. So in Poland, you can read about it on the internet, but uh, I have my coffee cup. So basically what happens is I got attacked, attempted rape by another speaker. This was back in 2013, so before Me Too... And so, I actually came out of it thinking, like, I did well. This was a horrible experience, but I got myself out of it. This guy tried to rape me, and I bashed his head in with a coffee cup. I actually still have the coffee cup. Sorry, hotel in Poland. Yes, I did steal your coffee cup. But it was what came after. You know, I got a lot of... People didn't believe me. People said stuff like I was too ugly to rape, so I had to be making it up. Or I was just crazy. And had, I guess, hallucinated the whole thing. And people that I, I thought that, you know, by doing well in security, I had finally found, like, a tribe or a community in InfoSec. And after this, I realized that maybe that wasn't so much the case. And I think that was the part that was the hardest. And afterwards, it was things like being in a crowded room were stressful. And, oh, that's conferences, isn't it? And, you know, I found, like, I was having trouble working, but I felt like, well, I wasn't raped. This wasn't actually so bad. So I don't really have any right to, like, have this traumatic response to it. Or if I do, then I am crazy. And the guy was right. And it kind of went into this circular thinking. So it kind of went off the rails a little bit. And it wasn't fun. So let's just carry on. But, you know, I get the last laugh in the end, right? Because... This was also about the time my book was coming out, and, you know, everything kind of came to a head at DerbyCon that year. Like, my class did not go that well. It was... N but it's funny, because the week after that, I went to Europe and did a class and got, like, perfect reviews. So I wish I could switch those, because DerbyCon was always my favorite. And I feel like that was the moment where the community, like, entirely turned on me. And then my book was coming out, and... There were, it hadn't even come out yet. There were already reviews about how awful it was, like, coming out, and people were writing about how terrible it was, and, yeah, it was not the launch that I had hoped for. You know, in hindsight, with all the sales that we've had, and we're in five languages now, and how many people are waiting to see the second edition, you know, it doesn't, you don't really remember that when the actual launch happened, it was terrible. So what did I decide to do? I decided to stick my tongue out at InfoSec, like one of my horses is doing here, and I left. I left the community, and I went and did a startup accelerator called Mach 37. So I decided, well, I'll go learn more about business. Well, part of it was I needed to learn more about business because a lot of my income had been from conferences and training and things like that. So since everybody hated me in the community and weren't gonna book me anymore, then I guess I had to do something else if I was going to save my business. So yeah, I went to a startup accelerator. You know, I had my my uh, product, well, open source at that point, smartphone pen test framework, and it was for mobile security testing. Felt like that was a gap in the market anyway. So I found a startup accelerator that catered to cybersecurity people who were you know, researchers, helping them turn their stuff into products. You know, being an autistic person, I'm not sure to this day, even though I still do it, that startups are actually for me, because startups are a roller coaster backwards in the dark, as I like to say. So, you know, it's really, can be incredibly stressful, but also incredibly rewarding. So, you know, I like going to college early, I think, you know, taking these big steps that may seem a little dramatic can really be a good thing, you know, finding the place that, you know, works for you at the time. 
So, like, going from eighth grade to college early, you know, was finding the right place for me, you know, dropping out of the infosec world and, and moving on to more of the cybersecurity business world. At the time, you know, it did, it was the right place for me. I've learned a ton from the experience. So, you know, I did do my product. It's uh, called Shavira. I have a product called Daga through it. We do mobile security testing products. You know, if you guys are interested in trying it out, hit me up. Twitter, email, all of those places. I'd love to get you guys' feedback. Uh, my original logo and my, my new logo. So, you know, I learned a lot about business. You know, I went from, you know, kind of the girl with the, the spikes and the leather and stuff to, you know, the button-down shirt and the normal-looking hair and, you know, serious business person. But, you know, I found that there was a lot stacked against me. I mean, certainly the autism thing, you know, uh, about 2% of venture capital funding goes to women-founded companies. So, you know, there's certainly sexism in InfoSec, but there's sexism outside of InfoSec too in the greater business world. So I had that. And it's it's definitely, there are things that are challenging in the startup world for sure, but it, it's also been very rewarding and has helped me with, you know, my broader, even technical career. So, you know, taking an outside career path, you know, if you're very set on being, you know, you want to be a hacker, you know, taking one of these career paths, like going into, you know, venture capital or startups or something like that, you know, it may be, you know, the right pieces to ultimately lead you in the direction you want to go. At least it was for me. So that takes us to about the time to Me Too. So me, the Me Too movement happened and suddenly everything made a lot more sense to me. You know, I talked about a little bit about how basically I had PTSD after my experience in Poland and I didn't feel like I should because I didn't feel like compared to survivors of things that were way worse than what happened to me, I didn't feel like I had the right to have PTSD. And I didn't understand why, like, things were so difficult. I didn't understand why people were being so mean to me and saying they didn't believe me. And the Me Too movement, so many people had, like, the same story. And I suddenly realized that, wow, it was okay to be imperfect. It was okay to be unfinished. It was okay to make mistakes. And that I needed to forgive myself. And honestly, the people who were so awful to me, you know, needed to you know, look at themselves, that it wasn't all on me. Sure, I made mistakes, but, you know, I didn't have to be perfect. That It was really not as bad as uh, it became. And, you know, that gave me a lot of validation, honestly, that, you know, what I went through was an okay way to experience life. Even, you know, even though I'm autistic, it didn't make me non-human. And then, years and years later... I got this call, and it was from a reporter. You know, I get calls from reporters a lot. I love doing press. But this particular one, he sent me these screenshots from Facebook. And, you know, all these years later, and I'm like, God, aren't we past this yet? People are still writing this nonsense about me on the internet, about DerbyCon in 2013. And this is like, I don't know, it was like last year. And there are some bad actors in the community Definitely, you know, there's the sexism, there's the racism, there's a lot of elitism. Like, if you don't have 30 years of experience in, and you're 20 years old, then you're not cool enough to be here. And you're going to get the naysayers. And everybody says, you know, haters going to hate, shake it off. I love Taylor Swift, but, I mean, that's just not how the human mind works. I mean, people are going to say, your stuff is awesome, like, 99% of the time, and your brain is going to fixate on the bad stuff. So I think that you should recognize that and don't beat yourself up for fixating on it. But what works for me is to take stuff like this, put it in my little folder of hate. And when I need, you know, a drive to stay up longer, work harder, you know, get it done. I remember stuff like this and I'm going to show them. I'm going to get the last laugh. And I encourage you to as well. Because something's wrong with them, not you. Speaking of media, I've had some great media experiences. This is one of them. I was on ABC World News tonight and it was me and Tim Cook talking about the FBI versus the iPhone story a couple years ago and well, the main thing I learned from that was how many people still watch the news? How many people who bullied me in middle school were writing me on Facebook saying I saw you on the news? So that was pretty cool. It's also in this documentary on PBS called Life Hackers and these 
three students. They were all women and minorities. They basically took this big green bus around the country. You know, you can look it up and watch it. It's a really fun movie. And, you know, I told them stuff about, I guess, the miniaturized version of this talk. And they went and saw a lot of different people and got career advice. And the best part about it, though, was that, like, the next year, one of those students was a goon at DEF CON and came to my book signing, you know, in the shirt. And I'm like, wow. So it's definitely possible from all, like, walks of life, including being on a green bus, to make it in security. But yeah, go check out the documentary. It's really cool. And another thing, Tribe of Hackers. You know, if this talk isn't really resonating to you, if this is way out of left field for your personal experiences, I would really encourage you to check out. It's now a book series, Tribe of Hackers. There's, I think, four of them. Marcus Carey, the main editor, you know, he is, he's black and from Texas and grew up poor. You know, I'm from Mississippi and I, I'm a white woman, but... We, of course, had different paths into security. Jason Street, who's in a lot of these books as well, you know, he was homeless at times. So there's tons of different ways to get into security. So this is just mine. Hopefully, you know, some of my lessons learned and stories can give you ideas like, you know, definitely the perseverance, don't take no for an answer, or don't, definitely don't say no for somebody else because they'll say it for you plenty of times. You know, put yourself out there, work hard, persevere, all those things. But... Again, if my story is not working for you, there's tons of other ones in these books. Definitely check out Tribe of Hackers. There's, you know, we don't just talk about how we got into security. We talk about, you know, different things about security and all that. So definitely check out that series if you're interested in getting into security. Because there's a lot of us out there and somebody's career path will be like yours, I'm sure. I said this was about a horse, right? So in the end it is. So... One of my biggest problems is that I can be very single-minded and I can work myself so hard I burn out just to the point where I'm like non-functional. It was kind of what was going on during, you know, the time after Poland as well. I was just so burnt out on the whole thing. I was hardly able to get my work done. And when I went to Mach 37, actually one of the first things the people at Mach 37 said was, you need a hobby. Because I didn't do anything besides work, which made when the community turned on me and my career was, as far as I could tell, basically in the toilet. Uh, it made it just that much worse that this was my whole life that had just blown up. So I was like, well, I rode horses when I was a kid. I'll ride horses again. What's the worst that can happen? Well, you know, horses are expensive and startups don't pay very well. So I guess the worst that could happen is I spend all my money on a horse. And this is Tempo. He's the first horse I got. And, you know, everything that I miss from my lack of understanding of people tempo makes up for it a thousand times and you know when i feel like giving up and i feel like it's just not worth it and i just want to run away and go live in a hole like tempo reminds me why i need to carry on like if it's not enough to do it for yourself find someone or something to make it worth it tempo makes it all worth it i love him and then there was my i guess sally field moment so i said I left security about the time the book was coming out, pretty much. So, you know, the book doing well was kind of like something I saw in royalty statements because I kept getting checks and it kept coming out in different countries. So it was kind of in my mind that, okay, I guess it didn't go as badly as I suspected. But a couple years ago, I did a keynote at Carbon Black. One of the things that Mach 37 did for me is it opened going from just the hacker conferences that I've been able to speak at things like RSA and this was, you know, Carbon Black's conference. So things that are more business oriented. So instead of just preaching to the choir of other hackers, it's been able to get me out to a wider audience. So I was the keynote at their conference and then they had me at Black Hat. They bought 300 books and they were going to give them away and I was going to sign them. And I was so afraid nobody was going to come at all. I was so worried about it. And then it looped around this gigantic booth multiple times in an hour we gave away all of them and there were still people in the line so it was my oh you do like me you really like me those jerks on ill mob don't like me but you know the bad apples of the elitist the biggest the misogynist the racist they're not the people that matter the people that matter are those people that you know stood in line to get this book the all the people that want to make it insecurity like 
making them happy is what really matters and they liked me that day and i was so happy and i felt like everything had gone full circle i was finally had the success that i wanted or maybe i had it the whole time and just didn't notice but it took running away and doing something completely different to get to that point and you know i said that startups may or may not be for me but one thing good thing that i have gotten out of startups is that I've been able to mentor other startups, you know, other people that are, you know, want to do startups, you know, kind of have experience in that space as well as in, you know, the hacking space. And that generally leads to small stock options. And occasionally when those startups do well, you know, that, that leads to rewards. And just recently that happened and I was able to get another horse. This is Denver. That's not me riding him. That's his old owner. I don't ride nearly that pretty, but he's awesome. And so, yeah, everything works out well in the end. Cause I get like this really awesome horse and I, I still have tempo and everything's going really well. And now I get to keynote for you guys. And hopefully I haven't run over too terribly, awfully bad and hopefully you guys have gotten you know something out of this and you know really what i want to impart to you is that you know this is me in egypt i'm now a six continent speaker i wanted to go to egypt my whole life and i finally got to do it last year and that's where i got my sixth continent you know speaker trainer author startup entrepreneur you know media talking head you know all these things that i do you know i I'd rather let a an odd path to get where I am but I think the biggest thing is that a lot of the things that seem like the worst things ever like the community turning on me like led me to where I needed to go to get to the next part of my career I know I don't think I would have gotten to where I am today and had the opportunities that I had if that hadn't happened as bad as it was and so I guess no matter how bleak it looks it's likely gonna get way better if you persevere and carry on, and I know that's hard, I certainly struggle with it at times myself. This like, it would be so much easier to just give up, but you know, I encourage you again to put yourself out there, be naive, be arrogant, apply for things that you don't think you have a chance of getting, do it anyway. Don't say no for other people. And you know, the sky is the limit. I think, you know, we have, a really interesting job as security people. We need to stop fighting with each other and start actually fighting the good fight because the state of security right now is really terrible. And while it's a really hard problem to solve, I think we can do better. And I think a lot of you that are, you know, wondering if you're gonna be able to make a career in security, you know, if you are able to, if you do persevere and get there, I think some of you will be the ones that make the great strides towards, you know, making the world a place where people can actually live securely on the internet, which would be really great. So thank you guys for your time. I really appreciate it. Please do hit me up if you have any questions about well, anything, career thing, book things. The only question I don't answer is when the second edition is coming out because like the horizon, it is an imaginary line that recedes as you approach it, like in this picture. See you guys, thank you.